Okay, so the next result that we are going to see is going to be a little more non-trivial. It's going to require a little bit more involvement. So do you think a positive matrix can be nilpotent? So the question is, can a positive matrix be nilpotent? Why not? Think, it, think in terms of what we have done until the previous lecture, until Jordan canonical form, not specifically today. What is the trace of a matrix equal to? What do we know the trace of a matrix to be equal to? Some of the eigenvalues. What do we know about the eigenvalues of a nilpotent matrix? Zero. They're all zeros. So what must the trace of a nilpotent matrix be? Zero. zero. What is the trace of a positive matrix? Positive, positive non-zero. So there you have it, right? You don't have to write down everything. So the answer is an emphatic no. Of course not. There are several ways of arguing this, but of course one straightforward way to argue is that a positive matrix can never be nilpotent, right? So if a positive matrix definitely has at least one non-zero eigenvalue, therefore the spectral media radius of A is not equal to zero if A is positive. The only way it could have been 0 is if all its eigenvalues were 0 or if it were nilpotent. But it cannot be nilpotent like we have argued. So in general, a positive matrix must have a non-zero ra spectral radius. Yeah, by definition spectral radius is positive. So hereafter, the moment we are given A, can we not just convert it to A upon Ra so that we call this object as A hat. And we are assured that the spectral radius of A hat is unity. So in general, whatever we talk about positive matrices now in, with respect to the spectral radius and all, we can just reduce it to the question of a normalized positive matrix correspondingly. Yeah? You agree? We need not worry about the specific spectral radius of a given positive matrix. Whatever is its spectral radius, just normalize it by that. So you get a new matrix. This is a scaling. Although I've written different, diff uh, I mean, division. Of course, you cannot divide a matrix by a matrix. So this is a diff division by a scalar, which is non-zero guaranteed because it's a positive matrix. So therefore, this matrix, we know that such that the spectral radius of A hat is definitely unity. So this is just a bit of normalization that we do. All right. Now suppose, see what, what, what are the claims I made? I made a claim that you have exactly one eigen, eigenvalue on the spectral circle that is, that is on equaling the spectral radius. You cannot have any other eigenvalue anywhere on the complex plane, which is just have the picture in mind. You have this circle here. So now it's boiled down to the unit circle because this has unity. So there's basically this one. And none of these other points that you can potentially check out for eigenvalues will ever yield any other eigenvalue. That's what I claimed. So now it's time to try and show why that must be so. Okay. So suppose we assume that, so we are going to talk about A hat hereafter. Okay. The normalized positive matrix. <coughs> so suppose the absolute value of lambda is equal to unity and A uh, x is equal to lambda x. But of course, A is a positive, or rather A hat is a positive matrix and R of A hat is equal to unity. Okay? So we are trying to argue the contrary, that on that spectral radius, you can have potentially other points also which correspond to the maximum modulus or maximum magnitude of the eigenvalue, right? So this we'll have to rule out why this cannot be the case, right? Okay. So suppose we take the moduli of entry-wise. This is a vector, this is a vector. We can take that. So then this becomes 
the modulus of lambda, which is just unity. So this just becomes this, right? <coughs> right? But what can we write this as? What is this fellow going to be? See, this is going to be, again, we have a hat ij xj, or rather 1j xj, a hat 2j xj, a hat nj xj. Each fellows individual moduli like this on the left hand side, right? And on the right hand side we have x1, x2, xn, x2. This must be true, yeah? But what can we say about if we had taken the moduli of A out first, yeah? Can we not say that the moduli of A hat x is less than, of course the moduli of A won't matter because A is a positive matrix. So I can just write this without the moduli. It's a real matrix, positive matrix. What difference can the moduli make? Can I not write this? Just think about it. Because now I'm restricting the entries of x to be only positive, positive reals, yeah? Earlier, this x need not just contain positive numbers, no? It can contain anything, complex numbers, anything, whatever we like. But now I'm just restricting it to be just the moduli of those numbers. So this is true, right? So if this is true, what can we conclude? If we are able to show that this is true, and not just is this inequality true, but it must be equal, then we'll be done. Because we started with the assumption that lambda is not equal to unity. The mod of lambda is, the absolute value of lambda is equal to unity. So therefore, we are led to this conclusion now. And this is what? True? So if we can now show that this is actually an equality, then we'll be done. So, so far, let's carry forward this inequality. What we have is a hat acting on x minus x. What does this remind you of? <clears throat> Something we've just seen. <clears throat> if the action of A on a vector, this is also a vector, you agree? It's a real vector. The action of A on a real vector has the effect of increasing its entries. Yeah, then what can we say? A hat raised to the higher powers. This must also be true. But now recall that we have this uh, different object here now. Let's say, let's define a new vector. Let's define this vector as P. So we have, on the one hand, from this we have a hat acting on P is this. And of course we have a hat acting on X also greater than zero. Yeah, so we have this and of course we have a hat acting on X also greater than or equal to zero. If you have two positive vectors, just like with positive numbers, what can we say? Both positive numbers, I don't care which is bigger than which, I can scale up the smaller number sufficiently until it becomes bigger than the bigger number. If I'm given two positive numbers, two and 10, I can always multiply two by 5.1 and it becomes bigger than 10. Same exact idea holds for uh, these uh, positive vectors, right? If entry-wise, Every vector in one 
uh, vector is smaller than the corresponding entries of the other vector. Then you just look at the biggest difference there is, scale it up suitably and you can make the smaller vector to be bigger than the first one. So I don't care essentially, I can always choose. It means that there exists gamma such that uh, E acting on P, which is less or which one will help me? Yeah. Yeah. Is greater than gamma times A acting on mod X or the, I mean with the abuse of notation. I can always find some gamma, right? To result in this, right? So what happens now? Substitute for this P here. So I have E acting on, actually I think I should call the lower fellow as P maybe? Perhaps I've noted it down wrong. No, I don't think so. Yeah. No, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. So this is a hat. I've missed the hat in the patient here. So a acting on a hat. P. P I can replace by x minus this x is greater than gamma times a hat acting on this x. Right? From which, yeah, I think it's right now. Uh, from which I can just pull out this A acting on A hat X is greater than one plus gamma times A hat acting on X. Yeah, that should be all right. Let me bring the gamma to the other side. Right? Yeah, that should work. And let's call this new object as B. So this is A hat. So you agree that, of course, gamma positive means this is also a positive matrix. Now what, is it, what does it tell me? A positive matrix acting on a vector is greater than this. Therefore, B to the K acting on A hat X is greater than A hat X. Sorry? Yeah, it's all A hat here. We have forgot, to, have I missed the hat, hat notation somewhere? If I have, then you put it there, yeah. It's all hat now. We have normalized it. We are not only going to talk about normalized positive matrices now so that we can just deal with the number one instead of having to carry R all the time. So you agree that this is true. Now, limit K tending to infinity. What do you think is going to happen to B to the K? What is one plus gamma? It's a positive number greater than one, sitting in the denominator raised to the kth power. So this is going to be zero, right? So in other words, you will have A hat X is equal to zero, but that's impossible, right? It's a contradiction. So where does this contradiction stem from? We assumed that this inequality was a strict inequality. That is what led to this contradiction eventually. So then this must be an equality rather than an inequality. And if this is an equality, then what have we got in one shot? Something very beautiful. Not only is one, exactly the number one equal to an eigenvalue of this positive matrix, the normalized positive matrix, but the corresponding eigenvector is a positive vector. Because after all, this fellow is a positive vector. Once I've taken entry-wise absolute values, it's a positive vector. So the largest eigenvalue is real, there can be nothing else on the 
circumference of that unit circle apart from the real positive eigenvalue. And the corresponding eigenvector is exactly going to be equal to some positive vector. Of course, you might argue, oh, hang on, I can just multiply it by a scalar which is negative and make it negative. Of course, you can. So it's either all positive or all negative, nothing in between. Right? Because it's eigenspace is the span of that vector, right? So you can also scale it in a negative direction. So in te technical terms, you might say it's either all positive or all negative. But we will only be interested in the all positive solution because most practical problems where we encounter positive matrices, the solutions also demand that we give some positive numbers as solutions of such systems, like the Leon TFs model. So at least this much we have seen that there is only one root on the unit circle for the normalized positive matrix equal to the spectral radius, and that's real. Corresponding eigenvector being positive. All right. Next, we're going to try and check out as to why this eigenvalue that we have now figured out, the real one, is going to be a singleton only. There can be no, it, it is non-repeating. In other words, its algebraic multiplicity is equal to its geometric multiplicity is equal to unity. Okay. I'm going to make some use of the Jordan canonical form, but I'm not going to explicitly write it down. I'll just tell you what the result is. I'm going to ask you to think about it and maybe it might help in your exams, who knows. So think about the proof. But we have done Jordan canonical form in sufficient detail so that you should be able to prove it on your own, All right? So, of course, do I need to really show that this AX, I mean, this AX is equal to A, x is equal to x. So even if this x to begin with was non-negative, you know that it's in the image of A. Anything in the image of a positive matrix, any non-negative matrix in the image of a positive matrix must be all positive. Therefore, indeed, the eigenvector is all positive, like I claimed. Yeah, that's just an aside. But yeah, let's get to the important business. Actually, we have uh, just shown you that there is this eigenvector, eigenvalue equal to the spectral radius, but we haven't technically really shown you that there can be no other complex number sitting over there. Even that I will leave to you to complete as a proof. The proof is not very difficult. There's just one key observation. So you see we had this summation AI, A hat IJ, XJ. So suppose there is another fellow for whom this is true. So right, so then what would you have? You would have some lambda x i, right? You would have some lambda x i, this is true. And then if you take the absolute values on either side, what would you come up with? You would come up with summation of the absolute values of a i j x j is equal to the absolute value of x i because the lambda i lambda would vanish if lambda was a complex number of unit absolute value unit moduli then this would be true but what does this tell you what can you conclude from this see this is the sum of the of each individual things here and if you now sum up these fellows as well what what happens to the sum on both sides So, okay, look at this. When is this equality possible? Like we have seen earlier, this is less than or equal to what? You take the absolute values of this and the absolute values of this. Now, because of that spectral radius and this fellow having a, a magnitude equal to unity, that equality still has to hold. So, you are basically asking for a hat i j x j is equal to summation a hat i j x j. But now, the only way that this is possible is if it's a complex eigenvalue, then the eigenvector is also complex. So these are all complex numbers. So what sort of complex numbers will adhere to this equality? 
if you had another complex eigenvalue of unit magnitude, then this would still be true, like in the previous case. Now, if this has to be true, what is this? This is the sum of certain complex numbers. Complex numbers are like vectors in a 2D space. If you are taking a complex number, scaling it up by a certain real number, because AIJs are real, and adding them, unless they are all aligned up together, can you have equality? If they are all aligned up together, what can you say about these xj's? Do you follow what I am saying? You take a complex number, you take a complex number along this direction, you take another complex number along this direction, you take their sum. That sum is never going to have a magnitude which is equal to the sum of the individual complex numbers unless they are all aligned up together. So they have to be all in the same line because complex numbers are like the 2D space. So if this equality has to hold, then all these xj's are along the same direction. A plus IB, gamma A plus gamma IB, 2 gamma A or whatever, alpha A plus alpha IB, so on. Which means what? That these numbers are all just scaled versions of each other. So you can just take out the complex number and cancel out on both sides. And you'll be left with the real part of the equation only, which means that the eigenvalue is just one. You started with an eigenvalue which is potentially complex, complex number of unit moduli. But now if this has to hold, and this equality has to hold like we proved earlier, if this equality has to hold, then all these complex numbers must line up together. If they line up together, they're scaled versions of one another. If they're scaled versions of one another, real scaled versions of one another. So those real numbers can be pulled out and that will be the corresponding vector. Right? And the complex part gets cancelled. The common complex number, let's say the unit complex number along that direction, you just pull it out as common and the other, others remain. So the common complex part gets cancelled. So it's a real number equated with another real number. And if that holds, then this lambda must be the real number one, not just some complex number of magnitude one. So that is actually the proof. So I kind of did not delve into that. But the lambda has to be unity. It cannot be a complex number. Yeah. I mean, I'm going a little quickly on this because, again, we want to get to the Leontief's model and answer that important question at the end. But uh, you, if you're interested, these are kind of optional material for further studies, like peron frobenius theory and also. It's pretty interesting. But if you're specifically interested, then you should definitely read up. What we are covering are some properties of positive matrices. Do read up on non-negative matrices. That's actually the contribution of, I believe, Frobenius. Oscar Peron first worked with only positive matrices. Okay, right. So we have kind of established that this is true. Now let's try and check out this positive matrix and say that the algebraic multiplicity of one is equal to one. And suppose the geometric multiplicity of one is more than one. Oh, sorry. It's the opposite, right? Yeah, the geometric multiplicity is one, but the algebraic multiplicity is greater than one, which means that it is repeated. If you look at the characteristic uh, equation, then there are more factors of lambda minus one than just one. It's lambda minus one squared, lambda minus one cubed, but there's only one geometric multiplicity, suppose. In which case, actually I can just choose it to be any number smaller than the algebraic multiplicity, the same argument holds. It means that it has a Jordan canonical form. If it has a Jordan canonical form, and if I keep raising it to higher and higher powers, can you imagine what's going to happen? At some point, you're going to have a combinatorial term when it raised to the mth power, m plus, uh, or whatever, m minus k plus one something, choose k minus one, yeah, times, I think, lambda to the m, sitting in the corner most diagonal. What do you think is going to happen to this as m tends to infinity? I leave it to you as an exercise. It's a bit of application of limits, L'Hopital. See, lambda is more than one, suppose. Okay? Or let's say lambda is unity. Lambda more than one is it's blown up. Lambda is unity. Then what happens to this? If the modulus of lambda is unity, then it's just this term, right? This is a combinatorial term that blows up. So what happens in the Jordan block as m tends to infinity, if you keep raising a to higher and higher powers of a Jordan block, do you see that the matrix, because ultimately when you have a, it is just some t, j, t inverse. So a to the m is also similar. So now if we let m tend to infinity, this fellow would blow up, which means a to the m must also blow up. 
yeah. But can A to the M blow up? <coughs> because what do we know eventually about A to the M? There is at least one eigenvalue which is unity. So if you take that eigen direction and if you keep hitting it, that eigen vector by the way picks out every column. See here is the argument very loosely speaking. If it had a Jordan canonical form which is not diagonalizable then we are in trouble because as m tends to infinity this blows up. Why is that a problem? Because if this blows up then this operating on any x, any vector would also blow up. Not any vector, precisely that vector which picks up that deadly combinatorial terms. But we have to have some vector, in fact the precisely the eigen vector corresponding to 1 will pick out every column. And if it picks out every column, then it's definitely going to pick out some term like this, which blows up. So therefore, A to the M acting on X, entry wise blows up. So of course, its norm blows up. But can its norm blow up? Because we know that ultimately along that direction, if you keep hitting it, what happens? It must result in equality, no? So it must be equal to the original vector. So you will come to the conclusion that the original vector is already an infinite vector cannot be the case. You understand? This fellow must blow up everything in along every direction. A vector which picks out every column of this has to blow up eventually. I know that the eigenvector corresponding to 1, the one which led to this, yeah, the eigenvector, the original eigenvector, not the generalized eigenvector, the original eigenvector is definitely all positive. So it picks out every column which means it has the effect, it captures the effect of every entry. The largest possible M that there is, that entry is also the cornermost entry. The northeastern cornermost entry of the Jordan block is also going to be picked up. Which means as M tends to infinity, this, that fellow must blow up. And if that fellow blows up the eigenvector, then it violates the very property that the eigenvector is left invariant. See the point? So therefore, you cannot have a Jordan block at least. If you have a greater, if you have algebraic multiplicity greater than 1, the geometric multiplicity had better also be greater than 1. So this is the part I said I won't prove. I will ask you to check this out. So this, this point is actually kind of ruled out. So the only other possibility is that greater than 1 and geometric multiplicity is equal to algebraic multiplicity, which is when we have a diagonal block for the eigenvalue corresponding to 1. Now apparently we can have the case because these terms won't appear now. The nilpotent part is not there anymore in the Jordan block for 1. So it's just the diagonal entries that are getting hit repeatedly and those are the only things we need to worry about. So why is that not possible? <coughs> okay. So if that is possible, suppose that at least the, uh, the eigenspace corresponding to uh, lambda is equal to 1 has exactly the requisite number of eigenvectors, right? If there are multiple, let's not say r, let's say k is the geometric and algebraic multiplicity of the eigenvalue 1. That means there's a k by k, k by k block of all one, uh, diagonal ones that is sitting somewhere in the overall Jordan canonical form. But this also means that there are exactly k eigenvectors, linearly independent eigenvectors corresponding to 1. So suppose x and y belong to a uh, kernel of i minus a, yeah, such that x and y are linearly independent, right? Then what happens? Actually let's do it a little differently. Let's say x belongs to kernel of i minus a transposed and y belongs to kernel of i minus a in two different directions let us say. So what can we then say? Now this we will not require, we can actually do with a transposed I believe. Yeah, I think I just, I was right the first time. Okay, let, let it be this. So let yeah, I think it should be okay. Let x 
or rather let p is equal to x minus uh, x i by y i times y. We have already seen that if these are both eigen, eigen vectors corresponding to 1, they must both be positive. And this is just the ith entry of x and ith entry of y. What do you think is going to be the ith entry of p? 0, right? So pi is equal to 0. But what is pi? Or what is rather what is p? p is also an eigenvector, is it not? Because it is the linear combination of eigenvectors for eigenvalue 1. But p belongs to kernel i minus a, right? If p belongs to kernel i minus a, implies p must be a positive vector like we argued. But p cannot be a positive vector if we choose it like this. So you cannot have diagonalizability either. So either way, if you have multiple eigenvalues, either it is a proper block diagonal form in which case this contradicts it or it is a Jordan form in which case it blows up and therefore it blows up along the direction of the eigenvalue, eigenvector as well. That is also impossible. So not only the fact that you have exactly one eigenvector, eigenvalue equal to the spectral radius, but also you can have no other complex eigenvalue whose magnitude is also equal to the spectral radius and the multiplicity of that real eigenvalue equal to the spectral radius is exactly the algebraic multiplicity is exactly equal to 1. So it's, this is a unique fellow, yeah, like it has no other parallel is what this means. So what does all this mean in the context of what we have seen so far in the Leon TF's model? Okay. You can try an exercise. I will not prove this, but yeah, I have noted it down as an exercise. Not relevant to the Leon TF's model, which we shall cover now in the next module. But before we, since we have done this much, the interesting deal is the eigenvector corresponding to lambda is equal to 1, which is the spectral radius, is all positive. If you take any other eigenvalue of a positive matrix, the corresponding eigenvector cannot be all positive. Okay, sounds very weird, right? So not only is the eigenvalue unique in that sense that it sits there in the real axis, but the eigenvector is also saying it is the only one in the positive octant or whatever you call it. When you have all its entries positive, in three dimensions we say it is in the positive octant. In higher dimensions it means that all the components are positive. So there can be no other eigenvector in that entire, uh, you know, octant so to say or the generalization of the octant thereof. That is the thing that you have to prove. So you try and assume that there is another eigenvalue. Of course, its magnitude is less than unity. And for that eigenvalue, assume that there is an eigenvector, all whose entries are positive. And then try to contradict, try to see why that cannot be possible. Whatever little bit we have covered of this peron frobenius theory, we should be in a position to get back to our Leon TF's model and deduce some interesting things. So what did we have? We had the fact that Lx is equal to x was required to have a solution. As your friend said, if everyone is thinking about profit, can this have a solution? If everyone is thinking about profit, what does it mean? So there is no external buyer. So will there be an incentive? This is very common human psychology, right? We do not generally tend to be philanthropical. That is why philanthropists are rare. We have nothing to gain out of this, no profit, then why should we keep manufacturing just for the greater good? People do not do that normally, right? Very grim view of the world, but that is true. So everyone would try to minimize or kind of get to a column sum which is less than 1. If that happens, if every column sum is less than 1, if every column sum is less than 1, can you have a solution for this? That is the question. Suppose every column sum is less than 1. Yeah, suppose every call sum of A L is less than 1. Let me hit this one with a 1 transposed on either side, right? That will also be 0. If I hit this one with a 1 transpose, what happens? 
then I have summation x i is equal to 1 transposed L x, right? What happens to this? Aha. Uh -huh. This is all summation row sum, right? Because this 1 transposed is taking the column sum. And the column sum is what? So L i, so let's say gamma i is equal to summation L uh, column, right? J i summation over J. Yeah. Yeah. So this is gamma i x i. Yeah, I think that's going to lead to the contradiction somewhere. Because now you see what I have here is 1 minus gamma i x i is equal to 0. What do I know about the x i's? Yeah, that's going to lead to the contradiction. What do I know about the x i's? They're all positive numbers because they correspond to the eigenvector for possibly the largest eigenvalue, right? So if these are all positive and these are all negative numbers, can the sum of all negative numbers be 0? Because this gamma i, or rather it's positive, no, gamma i is positive. So these are all positive numbers basically. Anyway, whether it's sum of all positive numbers or sum of all negative numbers, they cannot, cannot all be 0, right? So this is the contradiction. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah. So finally, after a bit of struggle, I've come up with the conclusion. So in other words, if everyone's trying to be profitable in this, in this game, so that's the lesson. We have proof that if everyone's trying to be profitable, unless there is other incentive, you will not be able to sustain such a system of economics, right? Just out of goodwill, just out of the sense of cooperation or fellow feeling. There has to be some incentive. What is that incentive? That incentive is going to be external demand. So, Currently, every industry is supplying exactly as much as is required to cater to its own needs as well as the needs of its other fellow industries. And you cannot profit out of this. If one fellow decides to profit out of it, immediately it goes kaboom, right? Explodes. But if there are external buyers who also want your product, then remember what happens. Then what you'll have is this Lx yeah, is going to be equal to x plus some external demand vector d. Yeah, then you will require i minus l or whichever way you like, like with a minus sign, whatever, x is equal to d. Now, what do you need? Essentially, if everyone's breaking even, but just about creating enough for each other's needs, this is not going to be invertible. Because 1 is going to be an eigenvalue if L has column sum equal to all 1's. If all the column sums of L are equal to 1, then 1 is an eigenvalue. Therefore, this is singular. So any arbitrary demand that I give you, you will not be able to meet it unless it is in the, current, it is in the image of I minus L. Only those demands which are in the image of I minus L can be met. You cannot meet other demands. Right? On the other hand, now if everyone starts to think of profit, then column sums become less than unity. Eigenvalue cannot be unity. This cannot be singular. This is non-singular. This always has a solution. Right? So in, in presence of an external demand for your products, the same situation, the same profiteering tendency that sort of did not allow your industry to sustain. Now if you're trying to profit out of this external demand, you will see that that will allow you to have a feasible. So now when there is external demand, people will be willing to cooperate and that's what people do. Why would Boeing try to manufacture aircrafts if people are living in stone ages and don't want to fly in aircrafts, right? So people have to have some interests. So when there are interplays between corporates or industries, unless they're each convinced about their dependence on each other and the fact that the end product that a related industry is supposed to sell has some demand in the market. Of course, it might happen a little late and then they realize a little later, so collapse is sort of delayed, but it will eventually happen. So external demand is what keeps the market driven. If the demand goes down, everything else will collapse, right? Because everyone will try to profit, profiteer out of it, and eventually no demand means you're only supplying for yourselves, 
and that will not be able to sustain your industry because your money will run out. Right? So that's what this uh, famous Leontief's model is. There's a lot more to it. In fact, it turns out if you know the theory of uh, non-negative matrices, you can prove a stronger result. Here, we have assumed that everyone is trying to profit here. And in the presence of demand, that allows you to sort of cater to any sort of demand. Actually, you don't need all of them to be profiteering. Even if one industry thinks of profit, the rest, n minus 1, do not even care about profit. Even then, your economy will be able to sustain. So that means, unless all your economic sectors are kind of you know, messed up, at least one has to survive. If none of them survive, if all of them sort of collapse, then you're doomed. But at least one fellow has to profit. That means the one fellow is at least producing more than it consumes. Right? In that case, you'll still be able to sustain. That cannot come from this theory that we have developed or talked about today. That will come from the theory of what Frobenius contributed to this, which is the theory of non-negative matrices. Right? So with that, we have come to the end of this. Thank you.